What happens when you can't pay your debts? Well, once upon a time, such as in ancient Greece, you might have ended up in debt bondage. Being a debt slave meant that you and sometimes your family would work for the person you owed the money to to pay off your debt. This is distinct from slavery since you were freed once your debt was paid. Later on in history, like in Victorian England, the poor were sent to horrific debtors' prisons and would later only be released when their debt was paid in full by friends or family. Other debtors' prisons functioned similar to workhouses and a debtor worked off not only their debt but their room and board to be freed. Currently, many countries now practice some form of bankruptcy, which reigns in debt and allows debtors to get a fresh start financially. That's not to say that questionable debt practices no longer exist. In some parts of the world, such as South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, debt bondage is still practiced. The United Nations estimates that 8 million people are trapped in bonded labor. Thankfully, there are many groups working to improve the lives of and free people from what the UN considers a modern-day slavery practice. However, today we're discussing the basics of how personal bankruptcy functions in the United States. There are actually six different possible types of bankruptcy in the United States. They are each named for the portion of the bankruptcy code they are found under. Chapter 7, Chapter 9, Chapter 11, Chapter 12, Chapter 13, and Chapter 15. Each chapter addresses a different type of bankruptcy. For example, Chapter 9 applies to the bankruptcy of municipalities, such as towns or cities. The majority of individuals file one of two types of bankruptcy, Chapter 7 or Chapter 13. People choose to declare bankruptcy for a myriad of reasons. Many financial literacy websites such as Investopedia state that a significant amount of people declare bankruptcy each year in the US due to costly health events. Two other major reasons why people end up filing bankruptcy are due to losing employment and poor financial choices, including excessive spending. Bankruptcy is a legal proceeding where an individual, spouses together, or a business makes a formal request to a federal court, declaring that they are unable to repay outstanding debts. Each type of bankruptcy requires different forms and procedures. For Chapter 7 bankruptcy, the debtor petitions the court that they are unable to pay their debts. So let's walk through how a Chapter 7 bankruptcy could proceed. Meet James. He has some student loans from getting his college degree, some credit card debt, medical debt from an emergency ER visit, and until five months ago, a decent job. Unfortunately, after being laid off, James quickly ran through the small amount of savings he had. While James has moved into his parents' basement to save money and has been working some temporary gigs, while he continues to look for a permanent job in his industry, he's months behind some bills. James decides to file bankruptcy. The first step is that James must undergo a government-mandated credit counseling. The U.S. Trustee's Office maintains an approved list of agencies that provide counseling at a reasonable cost. Debtors are required to file a certificate of counseling completion along with their other bankruptcy forms. Sometimes going through the pre-bankruptcy credit counseling helps a debtor to develop a plan to resolve their debts without going into bankruptcy. James's second step is to file bankruptcy forms with the court and pay fees associated with the cost of his case. In some instances, debtors can request a fee waiver. Generally, mandatory bankruptcy court fees cost between $300 to $400 US. The bankruptcy paperwork James has to fill out is pretty extensive. It includes forms listing financial information, assets, income, expenses, and property exemptions. An important requirement for a Chapter 7 bankruptcy is that the debtor does not have sufficient income to pay even at least a portion of their debts. If the debtor has enough income, they must file under Chapter 13 bankruptcy, which we'll discuss shortly. The decision of which type of personal bankruptcy to file, Chapter 7 or Chapter 13, is determined through the bankruptcy means test, which calculates the debtor's income expenses and debts to see if any repay is possible. Once James has completed the filing part of the bankruptcy process, an automatic stay goes into effect. This stay stops most debt collection efforts, which James really appreciates. Constant calls from creditors have been making him anxious. In addition to halting communication from creditors, automatic stays stop wage garnishments. In some cases, they even temporarily stop repossession, foreclosure, or eviction proceedings for the duration of the debtor's case, allowing time for the debtor to come to an agreement with a creditor. After James files paperwork, the court appoints a trustee to handle his bankruptcy case. The trustee reviews James's paperwork. Then his assets become part of the bankruptcy property and are scrutinized and evaluated by the trustee. The fourth step in the bankruptcy process is the meeting of creditors held by the court. At the meeting, James under oath answers questions about his finances from the trustee and any creditors who choose to show. Once the trustee gathers and reviews all applicable information pertaining to James's debt, the court makes a decision on whether or not James is eligible for Chapter 7 bankruptcy protection. If the court denies eligibility, James may have the option to file for Chapter 13 bankruptcy. 
Thankfully, the court granted James's petition. The trustee now decides which of James's assets to sell off for money to pay his creditors. Some assets are considered exempt from liquidation, such as the house the debtor lives in. As long as the mortgage is current, household furnishings, or a personal vehicle up to a specified value. Basically, essential assets needed to maintain a life. Common assets that are not considered exempt are investments, jewelry, valuable artwork or collectible items such as a stamp collection, and each bankruptcy case is unique and the assets sold depend on the facts in the individual case. Also, different states set their own rules as to what assets are exempt and are non-exempt. Seventeen states allow debtors an alternative choice. They can either choose the state exemption system or opt to follow another set of exemptions created by Congress called the federal bankruptcy exemptions. If a debtor lies or tries to hide assets in his caught, the debtor can face penalties and may not have their debts discharged. In some cases, debtors can face criminal charges for fraud for providing false information when filing for bankruptcy. Depending on the individual situation, the debtor may be allowed to negotiate with a trustee to keep certain non-exempt property if they come up with enough cash or are willing to give up exempt property instead. So James has to sell off his coin collection to pay toward his debts, but he's able to keep his paid-off few-year-old commuter car. Depending on the state, a debtor may only receive an exemption for a functional version of an essential item. For example, if James owned outright a $40,000 car, a sports car, his trustee may sell the car for $40,000, use $35,000 to pay toward James's debts and give him a $5,000 credit for an exempt car. And at this time, James must resolve any secured debt by either returning the collateral or property or reaffirm the debt, meaning that he'll continue to make payments. If James didn't own his car outright and he has an overdue car note, he would have to let the car be repossessed or get current on the car note and continue to make payments. Obviously, if it's an expensive sports car, James will have to let it go, but if it's a budget commuter car, it may behoove James to figure out a plan to keep making payments. The final step James must take is to complete a debtor's education course and file a certificate with the court confirming completion. Then, generally within three to six months after James is filed, he'll receive his bankruptcy discharge notification and the automatic stay is lifted. Within a few weeks of receiving his discharge, James's case is officially closed and his unsecured debts, his credit card and medical debt, are cleared. He will continue to have to pay off his student loans. The public record of a Chapter 7 bankruptcy remains on James's credit report for 10 years. For Chapter 7 bankruptcy, some debts are not eligible to be discharged. Non-dischargeable debt includes spouse and or child support, most student loans, and income tax debt. Common debts that are wiped out are credit card balances, personal loans, and medical bills. If money is owed on a secured debt, which means that the debt has collateral, such as a mortgage or a vehicle loan, the debtor has a choice if they're current on their payments. They can allow the creditor to repossess the property, thereby discharging the debt, or they can keep the property and continue to make payments under the original contract. Debtors who don't have any valuable assets and only own exempt property simply have their debt discharged and they don't repay any part of their unsecured debt. The majority of Chapter 7 bankruptcies filed for are granted. For Chapter 13 bankruptcy, the debtor petitions the court with a different request. Instead of selling off assets and discharging debt like Chapter 7, debtors seek to reorganize their debt and establish a 3-5 year plan for repayment. Chapter 13 payments are then made monthly to the court-appointed trustee, effectively consolidating debts into one single amount. The trustee then distributes the money to the debtor's creditors, and the debtor doesn't have any direct contact with creditors. The Chapter 13 bankruptcy process may allow debtors to stop foreclosure proceedings and catch up on delinquent mortgage payments over time. It also allows debtors to negotiate and possibly set new terms for vehicle repayment and to lengthen payment plans for past due income taxes, child support, and spousal support. Meet Nicole. She has a car note, a mortgage on a small house, and a pretty good job. Unfortunately, last year Nicole had a medical emergency and missed a few months of work, wiping out her savings, which forced her to mainly live on her credit cards. Even worse, the medical costs exceeded Nicole's medical insurance. Thankfully, Nicole has recovered and is back to work full time. However, at this point, she's behind on her mortgage, car note, some of her credit cards, and has a lot of medical debt. When considering filing for Chapter 13, Nicole opts to hire a bankruptcy lawyer. For both Chapter 7 and Chapter 13, many debtors hire a bankruptcy lawyer to assist them through the process, which can be confusing. Hiring a lawyer is more common with Chapter 13 because it tends to be more complicated. A bankruptcy lawyer can cost anywhere from $200 for a basic meeting up to around six grand if the lawyer appears in court for you or your case is complex. In Nicole's case, she feels like it's worth it to shell out a few thousand dollars to try to prevent the foreclosure of her house. 
Like with Chapter 7, the first step in the Chapter 13 bankruptcy procedure is that Nicole must undergo government-mandated credit counseling. Then she files bankruptcy forms with the court and pays the associated fees with the cost of her case. However, as a part of her filing, Nicole submits a debt repayment plan which is often developed during credit counseling. Also, it's likely Nicole's lawyer would help her create the debt repayment plan. Once Nicole has completed this part of the process, an automatic stay goes into effect limiting communication from creditors and temporarily halting the foreclosure of her house. The court appoints a trustee to Nicole's case. Next, the court holds a meeting of creditors and then within 45 days a Chapter 13 confirmation hearing is also held by the court. For both court appearances, Nicole's lawyer goes with her. Nicole's lawyer has also been in negotiations with her creditors to get her the best outcome possible. At the Chapter 13 confirmation hearing, Nicole's repayment plan is reviewed. Creditors may ask for clarification and raise concerns or objections to the repayment plan. By the end of this type of hearing, if the debtor's plan is confirmed, the confirmation hearing is continued for another day, allowing time to redo the payment plan or negotiation between a debtor and creditor. In some cases at the confirmation hearing, the bankruptcy case is dismissed or converted into a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Luckily, at her first confirmation hearing, Nicole's repayment plan was accepted. Then the court considered whether or not to have Nicole's Chapter 13 monthly payment be deducted directly from her paycheck. They opted to let her make the monthly payment to the trustee on her own. For the next five years, Nicole will continue to make a monthly pay on her debts. After five years, if Nicole has remaining credit card and medical debt, it's discharged. She'll continue to make mortgage payments for her house. During the five years, Nicole was able to complete her car loan and she now owns her car outright. In general, Chapter 13 debtors must petition with repayment plans that can take between 3 to 5 years to pay off. Once the years of repayment are completed, the record of the Chapter 13 bankruptcy stays on the debtor's credit report for 7 years. During the 3 to 5 year repayment process, the debtor isn't allowed to incur any more debt, such as a new vehicle loan, without court approval. Also, debtors must maintain insurance on any collateral or properties. So why do people file bankruptcy instead of seeking out other options, especially since declaring bankruptcy affects credit scores? Having a record of bankruptcy makes it hard for a consumer to open new accounts, obtain unsecured loans or credit cards, and sometimes makes them ineligible to purchase a vehicle for several years. Bankruptcies can even affect getting security clearances or professional licenses. However, we'd like to stress that each bankruptcy is unique and there's no one-size-fits-all answer. It utterly depends on the life situations the debtor is going through. Dealing with creditors can be extremely stressful. Others need a guided plan to begin rebuilding their financial health. Sometimes bankruptcy is simply the best option available. No matter what your financial situation, the best option for you right now is to click on this video for another great episode of the Infographic Show, or on this video over here. You're gonna love them both, but you've gotta decide on one, so click a video right now.